and welcome to Landscape Photography World, the podcast for everyone passionate about landscape photography. I'm Grant Swinburne and I'll be your host on this show, talking to landscape photographers about their motivations, likes and dislikes. This time I'm talking to Rachel Gillespie about her stunning brand New Zealand landscapes. Rachel is a full-time astrophotography guide in the Mackenzie country in New Zealand and hosts guests in a number of properties around the region. Her passion is the night sky and astrophotography is her love. She moved to the Araki Mount Cook Dark Sky Reserve as a permanent home where she's a mum to three and runs her busy guiding business from Twizzle. Her passion for teaching others how to get their cameras off auto and capture her beautiful country is her life's work. She takes us to her special secret spots and locations and talks about how she balances family and work in her busy schedule. I hope you enjoy the show. Hi, Rachel. Welcome to the podcast. How are you going? Hey, Grant. Awesome. Thanks for having me on. Uh, it's an absolute pleasure. Very pleased to have you on the show. Been uh, looking at your stuff uh, and, you know, the beautiful landscapes in New Zealand and um, really pleased that you've uh, you've said yes and uh, agreed to join me. So, um Absolutely. Guess, We've got to keep that rivalry going from over the ditch, right? <laughs> absolutely. Absolutely. If we can't if we can't win at, win at rugby, we might win at photography. <laughs> but I, I think you, I think, I tell you what, I think you win with some of the landscape cheer guys have got. The, the the mountains tend to get drag the eyeballs a little bit more than the outback does. Yeah, that's it. I actually used to live in Aussie for five years, so I have a oh, bit okay. of an idea. Yeah. Whereabouts? Uh, and good old Coogee Beach. Coogee, oh yeah, oh, you'll be uh, familiar where all with the some Kiwis of the go. some of the haunts where uh, where I go. I, I shoot down around Coogee and Bronte and uh, Bondi quite a bit. Yes, I've seen some of your shots there. Beautiful. Actually, it's lovely to uh, I guess get that reminisce type um, thing, and that's what I love about landscapes, isn't it? When you go to different places and somebody else is local, so cool. Yeah. Yeah, no, it's it's good to see people's uh, local areas. Um, so what, um, I, I guess, what's the Rachel Gillespie story? Just tell us a bit about yourself and who you are and what you do and why you do it. Absolutely, mate. Yeah, it's a bit of a journey, as we all have one. Um, I'm a mum, so uh, that's my number one job. I've got three awesome kids. They are currently almost 14 next week uh 12 and 9 so I've got two boys and a girl and I'm a single parent so my life is pretty busy um being a mum but I also have been very fortunate over the last number of years to become a full-time photographer here in New Zealand and uh previously before 2020 I was full-time photography guiding uh particularly astrophotography and a bit of landscapes so yeah it's been a pretty uh cool experience and at that time was based out of the Araki Mount Cook National Park area and Twizel which you may know of yep. um, and Lake Tekapo around that region for a long time so I kind of grew up around this area as well around South Canterbury and Tekapo so sure. um, yeah it's pretty cool um, yeah so my story kind of starts in photography only just four years ago I used to work in tourism for a bit before that and before, prior to that I was actually a life coach and business coach using some interesting techniques around quantum physics and I think that's probably why I'm really interested in photography because my brain is sort of geared to understanding how things tick so um yeah, you'll be loving my New Zealand accent on these words. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, no, I just love to know how things work and why things are the way they are. And I think that's why I got really into astrophotography at the start, because I um, actually started out learning astrophotography first. So right. quite unusual, probably compared to a lot of other photographers. And that was my passion. I actually ended up uh, becoming friends with... Mark G from The Art of Night, who you may have heard of, and uh, he's a pretty awesome astrophotographer here in New Zealand, uh, based out of Wellington. And, uh, yeah, just learned some cool stuff from him, went on a few adventures, and probably for me, my photography has always been about the adventure, more than it has about actually 
techniques. So Mm -hmm. over the years, I learned a lot of techniques that obviously have now become a big part of what I teach. But initially, it was more about the adventure and the experience. Um, Yeah, so I got a, I started out with a Canon 6D Mark I, which I still use and love and now I've got two 60s because I often take people out for tuition and uh, yeah I probably to be fair have done I'd say about 10 years worth of learning in four years I don't watch tally I'm yep. just obsessed with uh, knowing everything I can find out about what I do and I love looking at other people's work I think this sort of stuff what you're doing is awesome because you just can learn one little technique from somebody having a yarn and or just looking at somebody's photos online and seeing what settings they've used and you know that can transform your ability so I just love the community I find that it's just such a awesome inclusive space to live in and for me it's become something I've dedicated myself to as my lifestyle so I was quite determined um to actually make that my lifestyle. And I probably because nine years ago, I went through Women's Refuge so and took my mm-hmm. kids um, away from an uh, unhealthy relationship. So I think my passion is uh, equally as important to me, to be fair, as everything else. Um, and I just was lucky enough to find something I'm kind of good at, I think. I've got a bit of talent there. and. I just seem to find shots that other people don't always see or, um, you know, just go out and have a go. I think a lot of it's your attitude and, you know, there's a lot of people out there who are so worried about the settings and getting it perfect rather than just going and enjoying the moment. So that would probably be my number one sort of tip, I guess, is just get out there and enjoy the moment, even if you've got a cell phone, you know. Yeah, no, definitely, and I mean, you know, I I always say, you know, the best uh, the the best camera you you can have is the one that you've got with you. Um, Absolutely, you know, it, it shouldn't matter necessarily, uh, you know, what the gear is. I mean, yes, there are certain types of photography where the gear will matter. Um, you know, if you're doing sports photography, for example, you know, you want something that can auto focus you know, in an nth of a second because if you don't, then you're going to miss the shot, you know. So Yeah, yeah. The, and, and macro, if you haven't got a good macro lens, it's hard to do macro really well, you know. But, Absolutely. Um, you know, but I, I, I think, you know, that that's exactly right. It shouldn't be about, you know, necessarily all of the technical parts. That will come in time as, as you, uh, you know, grow and learn. But, uh you know, it, it should definitely be uh, about the enjoyment of the experience, you know. And I, I think because I take a lot of people out um, in my guiding business, I take a lot of people out who are beginners or people who haven't done a lot. Um, generally, they're shooting on auto and maybe poked a stick at manual, but they're not necessarily um, shooting manual very often. And I think what I've found, maybe it's just the type of people that come to me, I don't know, but I've found that, a lot of those people are a little bit have a bit of fear around shooting on manual because Mm -hmm. it might not be good enough or or it might they might make mistakes or whatever and my my whole advice is look just get in there and have a go that's how you learn you'll realize after you shoot a a morning of sunrises and they don't you get them back on your computer and they don't look right that you'll actually go back and have another go um, yeah. And, you know, we've all done that, I'm sure. Um, everybody that's on here listening, I'm sure everybody's done that to some degree. And particularly, I think, you know, with I, even though I started out on Astro, what I had to do when I started doing landscapes was quite interesting for me because my brain was uh, naturally going towards the Astro settings all the time. So I had to kind of retrain myself for um, landscapes and it took me another good six to eight months after I started that doing photography to get that right because I just wasn't in that frame of mind. So mm-hmm. um, I 
honestly knew nothing about compositions or anything like that when I first started so I was just like okay that looks cool I'm going to have a go at that you know and then I started doing a few landscape workshops and learning from other photographers and for me a lot of it was just um, what I'd call pause and relax just watch what other people do yeah um, learn by asking good questions and you know just a lot of it for the landscapes for me was also was I was really lucky I think when I bought my camera I had a I got a 24 to 105 um, Canon lens which was beautiful glass so um, that helped a lot obviously as a as a um, sort of a go-to lens and I still use that lens a lot today um, and have sort of learned a lot about how to do panoramas and stitch them together and things like that through astrophotography which I just applied to landscapes so yeah. I, I've kind of uh, intuitively gone along my road a fair bit and then there are times where I've had to stop and go actually you know what I'm not up to scratch on that topic I need to learn some more things so I think it's just really being accountable to yourself if you're teaching photography like I do you need to look at where you're missing your strengths and work yep. on that, um, that kind of thing. And so I've done a lot of workshops with a lot of other photographers who are better than me to learn. I think that's helped me so much. And, uh, you know, just as I said earlier, looking at things like Instagram and going, okay, hey, that's an awesome shot. What camera were they using? What lens did they have? What settings did they use? And generally, when I first started, people used to put a lot of that information on their posts. So yep. I learned a lot by just scrolling through there and having a good look. Um, sometimes I'd have a chat to people and just ask them what, what they're up to and, you know, what they're doing. And yeah. I particularly have, um, you know, been found people to be generally mostly really kind and, and obliging if you ask good questions. So that's been really Yeah, cool. I, yeah. I think as long as you, you're not sitting there saying, oh, hey, where was that, you know, <laughs> and, you, you know and you're asking, you know, oh, what, cam what camera did you use? I mean, you know, you might ask what camera they, they use, but I, I think, you know, what camera and settings and lens then sort of shows okay, I, I know a little bit more about it than just, you know, you know the, the, the standard, what camera did you use, you know? Yeah, exactly. And, you know, I think you just, we used to, when we first started photography, there were a group of us, we used to go on adventures together. So we'd spend like a week just going around the South Island, having a bit of fun, all just going out and taking photos and, you know, learning from each other and out, out of that group of five people I used to go out with I was the newest to the game so I probably um you know was the one that learned the most really and so I was lucky to have that um you know sort of I guess connection through my travel business which I had before photography where I had some good mates that were photographers and it's like anything and I, I just I hate this saying but it's true that you become you know the five people that you hang around sort of thing whatever that saying is, um, yeah. you know, the one I mean, and it, it really does rub off. And, you know, I know a, a few sort of corny sayings that, that people use and you go, oh, whatever, these days it's probably the younger ones probably don't even know what you're talking about. But, <laughs> um, you know, stick your hand in a pot of glue and something's going to stick has always yeah. been something that yeah. I've kind of liked. And I feel like that is um, still relevant it's kind of timeless you know and absolutely for me yeah. I think that's been a really big part of it so I've been really lucky to get some amazing opportunities um because I am quite good at talking to people and connecting and making relationships hmm. and I think that's been a big part of my success at the start particularly as well where people gave me an opportunity or gave me a start gave me a go because I asked for one and I think yeah. that's um, something that a lot of people struggle with in this game. If you want to make money out of photography, mm -hmm. um, it's highly possible. And people used to say to me, oh, you'll never make enough money out of that. You're never going to be able to go full time. And I'd just be like, well, you just watch me because that was the challenge I needed to go like around. <laughs> I, I just need somebody to say I can't do it and then I do it. <laughs> exactly. 
So, um, I mean, I grew up in an entrepreneurial family. My dad was in business his whole life. And so we grew up as kids being around that, I guess. And, um, you know, that's that same pot of glue thing again. Like you just learned how to do that quite intuitively, I suppose. And I think at the end of the day, you know, there's photography and then there's a photography business and they're probably quite different, um, really. So, you know, sometimes I feel a bit jealous that I'm not actually just going out doing photography for myself because you're always on the job. So um, I quite like to try and, you know, factor a bit of that in, which can be quite challenging as a a mum to... um, you know, get some of my own personal photography time in can yeah. be quite challenging because I'm always busy working for somebody else or or taking a workshop. And I'm pretty particular about taking workshops that I don't take many of my own photos because that's not what I'm there for. Um, you know, I'm there to help people. So, sure. yeah, it's, it's, it's a pretty cool industry though. And, yeah, I think at the end of the day, um, the thing I love about the Mackenzie country is you're always – coming to a different environment every single time you go to the same spots because the weather is obviously a huge factor in our four seasons are very defined we get a lot of um wind snow hail sun rain etc so you know we had a really big lightning storm the other week it was pretty crazy um and i was fortunate enough to be in the right place at the right time to actually catch a pretty cool photo so um yeah it's just it's one of those things where i think for me as i said earlier it's always about the adventure kind of good for the soul or something no definitely definitely (laughs) so can you tell me what came first was the the decision to go full-time photography or doing workshops and you sort of slid into turning that into full-time or um well i sort of i read a first yeah so how i actually started out first was really interesting actually and probably quite different to a lot of people is that i started promoting other photographers before i even had a camera so i was like selling workshops for other photographers and promoting them through my um i used to own nz travel magazine so i was promoting them through my magazine and uh it was i guess a, a the opportunity to promote other bigger names than myself so that was how I sort of started out and I was just going around with them running workshops and taking photos on my phone and people were like oh my god did you take that on your phone like what like that's such a cool photo and I was like oh yeah like it's just off my phone like no big deal you know (laughs) and then I was like oh maybe I should (laughs) <laughs> I know and then I was like maybe because I'm quite good at editing because I have always used Photoshop for does graphic design and stuff like that yeah. so um I just was like oh maybe I should get a camera and have a go at this so I just made a like on the spot decision one day like I'm gonna buy a camera I didn't even think it through I didn't have any plan I just went and bought the camera and I was like I'm just gonna give this a whirl uh so I actually went on a five-day photography tour with another photographer um, called Talman Madsen who mm-hmm. was tutoring the, the workshop and we had a, had a couple of clients. We went out and we just were so lucky to have this amazing, incredible week. It was uh, winter time. We ended up with uh, Aurora, which was crazy. We had uh, Milky Way rise at the Church of the Good Shepherd. We had snow. We had walked into the Hooker Valley track at minus nine in crampons and took these amazing astro photos. I was just fizzing and I was, it was almost like an out of body experience, to tell you the truth. We yeah. virtually were on the road driving from between Wanaka, the Lindus Pass, Mount Cook, Tekapo for five days backwards and forwards to basically the best spots at. at you know, that the weather was giving us because we had all those pockets of weather we had to navigate. Um, I was absolutely exhausted afterwards. (laughs) But it was the coolest, you know, a massive introduction into it. And so after I had been taking these random phone snaps, I then shared, you know, these 10 or so DSLR 6D shots that were auroras and Milky Ways and stuff, and people were just freaking out. (laughs) It was just funny. 
I was just, they were like, what happened to you? Oh my God, this is so crazy. So it was just one of those moments in time where I, I don't know if you believe in the universe of power or energy, but I just felt like it was my lucky break. I needed an opportunity. I had some really hard stuff going on in, in my personal life and the universe gave me a platform to stand on. And that's kind of how I see it is that I was basically given this opportunity to share my creative soul or heart or whatever you want to call it expression with others and that's actually my purpose here on the planet right like for the rest of my life so as as, as corny as that sounds that's kind of how I, I roll these days so um oh, and that's, enough. That's, that's, that's enough that's just enough like I don't need to be anything bigger than that you know yeah. and uh that's I, I always encourage people to ask yourself you know where is it that your heart sings and for me it's being on a mountain taking a photo by myself in the middle of nowhere or yeah. with a friend who's doing the same and that's where I'm happiest and so I've been lucky to find a way to get paid for it I guess um, by sharing it with other people so you know it hasn't been without its crazy rides and especially over 2020 and, and this year we've lost a lot of business it's been a huge uh, challenge to keep the business going mm. and fortunately because we don't have like an office or a premises or anything we've managed to, to keep things ticking over but it is very touch and go at times at the moment but um, we're just really hoping that we can continue to share you know new zealand's beauty with other people when it presents itself i guess yeah definitely definitely so what uh i guess drew you i, I know it's not away from astro but to landscape um what what about landscape photography sort of drew you in uh and, and got you into that yep. as opposed to the you know astro where you started yeah, absolutely. Great question, actually, Grant, because um, being an entrepreneur, I quickly could see that I was going to make more money out of getting better at landscapes because people used to buy landscapes off me for promotions or prints and canvases. I've actually been very lucky to have quite a decent print sale business mm -hmm. um, and nobody was buying astrophotography shots for their walls <laughs> so um you know i was like okay something wrong with this picture i'm spending a lot of time over here you know enjoying myself doing astrophotography which is cool but actually people want more landscapes so what i sort of realized is and nobody really taught me what to do i just kind of figured out a whole lot of stuff by trial and error yeah. um, and i think i just used my common sense a lot of the time and so what i sort of did when I first started doing landscapes was I'd talk to people about you know where's your favorite place what do you love why do you go there you know what is it you love about that oh what season do you love going you know stuff like that and so you'd get it yet again it was I guess that entrepreneur and me where I was um connecting with people mm -hmm. and then we might have a coffee and share our story and if somebody wanted to buy a, a, a print or a canvas for their walls I would usually go to their house if I could and just look at measure their wall and you know show me where you want to put this and get my measuring tape out and you know so created like a real a vibe before they'd even had the picture so yeah. um, I found that was really successful for me I kind of invested a bit of my time into people and then that always paid off a lot in the long run and sometimes people would buy more than one because I actually went to see them you know so I yeah. found that to be really successful and I suppose when you're out adventuring and you generally if you're doing astro you often do either a sunset or a sunrise anyway um you just sort of I guess become more aware of what's around you and because I had always, uh, before I did photography, I used to do a lot of guided tours anyway for walking, biking, and um, cruise ship customers and stuff like that as well over the years. Yeah. I already had a good understanding of that. I mean, I grew up on horses. I grew up on a farm. I, I've always had a connection with nature. Sure. I just hadn't really realized that I had an ability to capture 
that feeling. And I think that was something that I love about landscapes is when I go out now, I often will wait for the weather to be what I want it to be rather than being in a, you know, when you go to a place and you're not going back again, obviously you've got to take the shot because you're not able to return. But if you're in a place where like you are at the beach and like I am at the mountains that I can go there multiple times, then I'm trying to capture of a feeling or or an expression of of the place if yeah, you like yeah. so I don't know if that makes sense but yeah, yeah no make, I, make, I, makes a lot that really resonates yeah 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 and I think it's not until you actually sit which we're not very good at doing as human beings these days are we we're always in a hurry <laughs> um, and I think being a parent I find that also challenging I'm always got a big list to tick off of stuff of jobs I've got to do you know and you know if you're running it if you've got another job or you're running another business you've always got tasks all the time you're going to tick off your list you know and I think sometimes we get we've got it upside down right like if you actually just took the moments to sit especially in a place where you live sit and ponder in the sunrise when other people are sleeping yeah um you know, that's when you find sometimes find your greatest ideas for life. And I don't know about anyone else, but that you know, isn't that what we're here for? Like, you yeah. know, take your coffee, sit at the beach. Even if you don't take a photo, like you might take the photo the next time you come. It's just all about connecting with a place, with a feeling, with nature, mm. and then you capture that in your lens. And I think that's something that I do quite intuitively. Um mm. I might take some shots at the at a you know in a certain way, and then realize actually that's not what I wanted. I'm going to change this around, or I might change my lens even, and I'm just going to wait for a wee while for the sun to change or rise a bit more or whatever, and and then you know in a split second you might only get in a moment's opportunity to get the shot you actually are, are thinking of. So um, sometimes you might need to come back the next three mornings in a row to get the shot too. So yeah, yeah. I love that about landscape photography because that's actually probably become my counsellor or my healer or whatever you want to call it um, for life in a lot of ways because I know when I'm feeling agitated, and I guess this is a challenging thing in these lockdown times, it's not as easy to get out, but you can still get your camera out in your backyard even and find something to take a photo of, challenge yourself to learn a new strategy, you know, um, different angles, different light. For me, I'm always shooting for the light in yeah, my landscapes. Yeah. Um, I probably tend to shoot probably two, um, maybe one or two uh, stops lower than a lot of other people because I mm. just, that's just how I like it. And then I'll edit that accordingly. Um, depending on your camera, of course, because every camera's got its different ways of dealing yeah. with the low light. Um, the 6D is quite good for that because it's an astro-style camera. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, so, I mean, at the end of the day, it just depends. Like, the other thing about me is I'm a bit of a, a rogue photographer in a lot of ways with my landscapes because most of my landscapes are handheld. Yeah, okay. Um, so that's quite unusual for a lot of New Zealanders. Most New Zealanders will probably shoot with their tripod. So yeah. um, I do a bit of a mix these days because people want to do both when you're on workshops. But when I first started, yeah. I, for the first year of doing landscapes, I didn't even use a tripod. So I've probably got quite good at that, I guess. And a lot of the stuff that I did around that was waiting for the scene to change, um, you know, rather than using a filter or, or, or something like that. So... Yeah, it's, it's been interesting because I think I've taught myself a lot of stuff because I just don't kind of go the same way as everybody else. I'm a, I like to kind of challenge things a wee bit and try something different. Or if my mind tells me if you did this, this and this, then you'll get that result. I'm like, hmm, I want to try that, see if that works. Um, yeah, I don't know. Just like to challenge myself out, and out yeah. there and give things a go. And this last 12 months or so, I've been really involved in a couple of big projects for uh tourism board 
for what you would call sports photography or adventure, outdoor adventure photography, yeah. helping them to get a library of images for uh, marketing the area for Canterbury, Mackenzie and Waitaki. So um, that's been really cool because I've learned a lot of new stuff and worked with videographers and you know, that kind of stuff, as you're probably aware, is, is pretty go, go, go. There's not much yeah, time definitely. to sit and, sit and ponder. <laughs> um, so I guess having had that experience of handheld shooting helped me in that way too because I probably wouldn't have had the confidence to take on, on those contracts had I not have done a lot of that before. Yep, I get it. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, so, you know, we're ever-evolving in this current current climate so rachel when you go into the field do you you know when you're shooting for yourself do you go into the field with a concept or do you let the concept come to you by reacting to the landscape and the light um probably about 50 50 to be honest um i think i used to be completely just let's go and see what's there and have a shot uh, mm -hmm. but these days i do tend to uh, plan things out a bit more than I used to. I've particularly, I think, because I've been to some places where I realise and I'll go back that there are, you know, certain different compositions that would be better afterwards or I might um, wait to a certain type of time of year or different weather or whatever, um, particularly in the Araki Mount Cook National Park because we get such four seasons, there are times of the year where it's just more spectacular sometimes so yeah probably 50 50 I do I still love the challenge of going to a new place not really knowing what it's like and seeing what I can create from that I think that sort of feed, feeds me um creatively as well sure sure yeah I don't like to be too super organized in my life in any way so I think that's <laughs> part of it I'm not a I'm not a uh, analytical type of person by by nature, so that's probably part of it. If you were, you would be probably a lot more uh, planning things out in more detail than, than I probably do. It's just how I roll, really. Yeah, I get it. Yeah. So you talked a little bit about Mackenzie Country and uh, you know the the area uh, around where you live. Do you find that? uh shapes your photography in in and in what way does it shape that photography yeah good question actually uh it used to be just where I was all the time and I partly because I was busy and just where I was at and uh yeah definitely has shaped my photography I've been very fortunate to be known in my area for my work because I was at the time one of very few people that actually lived in the area um because it is pretty you know out in the southern alps a mm -hmm. bit of in the middle of nowhere it's not near a city so um a lot of people come and go to those areas for a week or two every season but they don't live there whereas sure. for me being local that was definitely an advantage and i think uh probably to be honest got a little bit lazy at times because you just knew where you were going to go park up type of thing um, because I often had my kids with me I would have a lot of strategic places I could park up take a photo jump back in and go home um, all within yeah. like a half an hour time frame um, and you know stuff like Aurora which I did quite a bit of at that in that area was a bit like that as well because I often had my kids with me so um, it's kind of a needs must sometimes I think and uh, as I sort of started to develop my work a bit more, I realised uh, that I wanted to try some new things. So I've sort of branched out a little bit, specifically over the last wee while. I have done quite a lot of work down in Fiordland um, and the West Coast, which I really love. And it's a completely different sort of colour palette because in mm. the Mackenzie, you have sort of these layers of color and if you've been there you'll know what I mean by that if you haven't been there it is a very dry tussock yellowy brown base um, you'll often have a lake between that which is an aqua blue 
snow fed mountain sort of a lake or river yep. then you've got your brown mountain you often have a snow layer on that mountain and then you've got your sky so you've got you know five six layers going on mm-hmm. um, often for me I always found the challenge to look at where I wanted my focal point to be in the image because that's something that I work a lot on um you know, there's lots of lots of really cool parts of those McKenzie images that could be your focal point, depending on the end shot you wanted, um, that kind of thing. And because I was, for me, a lot of the time doing handheld, um, you know, that was quite important to me as to what I was doing as well. So um, I'm a bit of a mountain lover. So going from that to, uh, you know, different environments where there's a lot of running water, you know, yep. dark, shady tree areas, um, that kind of stuff. It, that was a good challenge because it's quite different settings. And, uh, you know, just trying to, I guess, rather than looking with your eye, lot, you know, 50 kilometres away from you, you're actually looking quite close, a lot closer um, yeah. in some of these other environments. So that was really good for me. And I've also in the last 12 months had been involved in a really special project for me that is a passion project that I love to do, which was with the Kaimanawa uh, Wild Horses, which was out in the um, National Park at Waiuru in the army camp. They have a a band, couple of bands of wild Brumby type looking horses, they're called Kaimanawas, and you'll have the similar ones over there. And... um, there's a bit of a story behind that as to what how that all came together because originally those horses used to get rounded up and culled every year, which yeah. was a pretty horrific, horrific thing. And then a, a group of really amazing people came together and uh, formed a charitable trust to help those horses. And now the between the New Zealand Army, the Department of Conservation and the Kaimanawa Heritage um, Horses Trust, they actually... Uh, retame and rehome all those horses every year so I was really lucky to go on to the photography tour of that this year and it's been such a cool experience and obviously quite different uh, you know a moving target in the landscape rather than just the landscape itself so that was really cool and I'm actually now doing some more work with them so um, that's been really exciting addition and I think this is the thing right like you're always uh I guess trying new things and and you know sometimes you don't always know where it's going to end up and I quite like that about photography so um yeah and this year I'm doing a bit more work in the North Island so at the North Island and the South Island are very different in terms of landscapes so a lot more green lush uh panga type um flower uh, plants and flowers and ferns Mm -hmm. and forest and things like that so that'll be quite a cool a lot of waterfalls which is really cool so um cool. yeah different different things all the time and my I was supposed to go to Iceland in 2020 so I missed out on that so far but really really excited to go and do that in the future sometime um but you know I think we are pretty lucky in New Zealand to have all these different landscapes so close by yeah well, by um Bar, I guess, some of the uh, more um, radical uh, mountain shapes that you might have there in uh, in Iceland, you you pretty much got you know a, a similar sort of uh, you know uh, terrain, you know, with the with, with mountains, with you know ice fields, glaciers, even even the odd volcano, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I was just going to say I'm really excited about that and that volcano. I'm just, I don't know, I just keep looking at the live streams all the time. I'm yeah. so excited about it. My kids think I'm nuts. <laughs> I just think it's so amazing. I don't know if you follow Chris Burkard, but he was over there yeah. Um, yeah. not long after that. And, oh, so cool. Like, I don't know, it's just one of those things that gets in your bones that you just want to do, I think, you know. Um, so yeah, I'd love to go there, but I also would love to go to Canada. I think that's another place um, yep. that's that's I guess kind of similar, but and it's it's just so big. And that's the thing about New Zealand; it's a small place, and a lot you know, in respect to a lot of other countries. So um, yeah, yeah. I think we kind of have that uh, in our blood, Kiwis. Like we just want to get out from down under. You probably have the same, you know, go somewhere different. <laughs> Yeah, I, I think everyone uh, has that 
that um, I guess landscape jealousy. You know, I, I I look at New Zealand and Canada and Iceland and go, yeah, I really really like to shoot that. But I know some people, you know, that, that that shoot in the states and Canada and whatever, and they'd love to be here doing the beaches and the outback and so forth. So you know. That's, Absolutely, uh, you've got you some always want something scenes. you haven't got. <laughs> I know <laughs> you've got some spectacular scenes there too, though. I, I feel, yeah. Oh, absolutely. I think yeah. It's uh, you know, New Zealand is a, a four seasons in one day kind of place sometimes. So you know, yeah. as a photographer, that's pretty cool. You can um, you know experience some. We've actually had some pretty crazy storms here over the last couple of weeks, actually, and uh, there was actually one up in the mountains um, last night and today, actually. But, um, yeah, it can be, especially at this time of year, September, October, can be just crazy weather in the same day. You're just like, yeah. what's going on? Um, and I think that's, you know, it's really cool for the senses, all that stuff, right? It's, oh, absolutely. I don't know, you'll hear me talk about this all the time, but photography is a vehicle for a lot of people I think to you know help you to grow your own self and I think that's such a cool way of doing it rather yeah, than definitely. lots of other other types of ways you could choose so uh, we are lucky that we are able to do that and you know here in New Zealand you'll probably laugh at us at times but my friends always laugh at me because I'm always wanting to know what's the weather forecast they're <laughs> like oh my god like you're not checking that again are you you know like <laughs> And I think it comes with farming as well. Yep. You grow up on a farm, you're always looking at the weather. Um, and, yeah, you, know, you want to know what's going to happen in the next couple of hours because you, you yeah. might, might need to do a little bit different work than you thought you're going to start with. Exactly. So, um, you know, and with, with night sky, you're very particular about that stuff. Um, yeah. And I guess that's where I am particular at certain times. And uh, you know, looking at where the Milky Way is rising and what time, and I know a lot of that stuff off the off my head. But um, you know, when I first started out, I had a bit of advice from a mate of mine, um, Jordan McAnally from Undersoul Photography. He's a really good astrophotographer, and he said, you know, go for the first year of your astrophotography without using apps. Just do it with your yep. mind. And I was like, that's such a good idea. So I actually took that on board. And so I trained my brain to know where things are, just like you do with the sun um, at different times of the season, the astro season, because, um, you know, that's just something that was I wanted to master a wee bit more. And so sometimes I'll use apps now, I'll use photo pills sometimes with clients because you have to be in a hurry, but um, you don't have to have all that fancy stuff. And I think that's something that's really important for people to realise if you're new to photography is just go and shoot with what you've got because yep. I started out as a single mum with no money and I had one 60, one 24 mil Sam Yang lens that was second hand and I had one 24 to 105 Canon and that was all I had. I had a crappy tripod and I had, I literally I think I had two batteries and two SD cards and that was it that was wow. all I had so I was just like well I'm going to make this work if I want to be up there with the big boys I've got to, to get out there and I guess maybe in some ways that was actually to my advantage because being female in astrophotography is also a little bit different as well mm -hmm. um, there is it's a very male dominate, dominated field in a lot of ways I think that's starting to change but you know, it, I don't know if it's been the same in Aussie, but New Zealand's kind of gone through this um, sort of a a real revival of astrophotography over the last five years. Like this, all of a sudden, there's just like yeah. all these people doing astrophotography. Um, yeah, it's def so definitely been, grown over here too. It's been pretty cool. And, you know, I, my long-term passion is actually to teach youth photography um, for adventure landscapes outdoors astro whatever they want to do and um you know help them with moving forward in their lives through photography so I probably always had that in the back of my mind because of my own journey and uh my own children just wanting to share the magnificence of what we actually have here in New Zealand to help people understand how that can impact their lives. I don't know. It's quite a quite a cool 
opportunity to be able to do and you can actually do it here in New Zealand quite simply it's not that hard so yeah, yeah. I think that's our gift as a country we you know provided obviously we're not on lockdowns and things we can there's a lot of things that we can do here that are not difficult logistically wise and all of that because of the size and you know people are often used to being outdoors yeah um all of that so i'm hoping that that'll be something i can create as time goes by really love to have like a charitable trust or something like that for youth photography oh, and fantastic. i've had a couple of kids i've taken out who have come from you know not the best yep. environment or, or challenging circumstances and gave them a camera to keep and they're just like beside themselves and take them out for a week around the mckenzie and you know not just teach them how to take photos but just talk to them about life and get out there and realize that you can give anything a go you know and I think that's what photography does for me as well I tend to take out a lot of women women attract obviously to come with me at night yep. that's another advantage in a way I guess um, and I think that's quite special to be able to empower other women and men too but you know particularly in the night sky field um you know it just seems to be a special thing that i get to do so it's yeah, pretty cool yeah. yeah well i think um i mean i know i i follow quite a few uh kiwi photographers uh both male and female and um i mean i i, I think a you know you, you you sport for choice in terms of some of the landscapes and whatever that you've got but one thing that's really stood out for me particularly in social media, particularly on Twitter, uh, in fact, is the the sense of community that there seems to be in New Zealand with, you know, between the the photographers and in particular in that sort of astro field and landscape field that, you know, it seems to be uh, quite a strong bond, I guess, between some of the uh, photographers there that, um, you know, it's probably probably reflective of the the size of the organ uh, size of the country i guess and the you know the um the the, the closeness that you might feel towards the, uh, the the landscape as well yeah it's been a really cool and it's cool you point that out actually because you we come kind of forget about that sometimes um it's a very tight-knit sort of a, a community. There are a lot of people who choose to not be a part of it, and that's fine. But there are a lot of people who, uh, you know, connect, and um, social media has definitely obviously been a contributor to that. And I think Instagram was definitely a bit of a catalyst for that kind of um, vibe yeah. in New Zealand because when it first came out here, kind of became a thing would have been about uh 2013 2014 something like that and that was kind of like where I think that's one thing about Kiwis were quite early adopters to stuff like to technology so there was just like this big influx of all these people on Instagram and then everybody's like wow did you see so-and-so's pictures and oh my god did you see this and Mm -hmm. and it just kind of took off all of a sudden and a lot of those people were already there before, but you just weren't aware of it as much. Um, yeah. def- definitely not as much as like Facebook. And I think that Instagram kind of propelled that. And I've just, I've noticed this whole, as you say, the, the Twitter um, NFT space, which is where I've met you. It's, it's yet again, there's been quite a bit of an influx of people and we kind of all trust each other, I think, um, mm. to go, okay, hey, let's do this. So there's a bit of a, there's a lot of camaraderie as well as um you know connection in there which i think is quite good as well um you know you're all everybody's kind of i guess going to the same spots um because it is a small place and, and all of that as well so yeah, yeah. i think it's actually really healthy and the fact that it gets um you know for me anyway i think that it's what i like to do is to, to take my shot that i see Sure. I don't compare my shop to anyone else's or or think someone's is better than someone else's or whatever. And I think that that's really important as a, a landscape photographer as well as to take what is from your heart and soul or whatever you see and capture that because that's actually your own essence. Totally. And that what I've found is really cool about that for myself is that people 
have this kind of like expectation on my account, my Instagram account to go, oh, this is what we're expecting from you. Um, And it's it's actually a really interesting conversation because people that often follow you sort of almost feel like they're invested into into what you share and who you are and and all Mm -hmm. of that. And um, I find that's actually quite fascinating and it's really cool that people even care because they love your work and, um, I firstly found that to be like 99% of the time really positive. So I think that is really special. And for me, I've got my people who will then reshare my work or, um, you know, somebody goes, oh, who's the person to to do, you know, should, who should I buy a print from? And so I get referrals and, yeah, yeah. and things like that. And I think that that relationship that you can build, and I've found that on Twitter as well. Like I've met some people I've, online that I've never met in person that have just seemed to be the most genuine, kind, lovely people who actually genuinely want to help you. And it's just like, oh, wow, this is so cool. Because you just never would have, had any other probably way in real life to meet that person so no, I think no. that's one real special thing about social media I had I had a bit of a uh, up and down relationship with Facebook for a while there and a friend of mine said to me you know like you're putting your emotion onto a, a social media platform it doesn't owe you anything yep. it's actually just a software program and I was yeah. like actually that really hit me on the head like actually that's so true like I don't actually have to have any feelings about how I feel about a social media platform because it's no, just software. Right. And it was quite a cool way because I think we get really caught up in all that stuff sometimes. And, you know, especially these last couple of years, there's just been so much crazy stuff on social media. Yeah, it's just definitely. like, what on earth? And I see people going, oh, that's it, I'm out. I'm not having anything to do with social media it's just too crazy or whatever. And I'm just like, well, hang on a second. If you just deliver to the platform your message, whichever is your photo or whatever, and then you jump off, that's what it's there for. And I'm just consistently doing that because I think that's just for me, it's a place to share my stuff. People who like my stuff will look. And, you know, at the moment that seems to, to work quite well. So I don't know. I think it, I don't care how many followers I've got. In fact, I couldn't even tell you how many followers I've currently got. Wouldn't have a clue. But I don't care about that. It's just about connecting with people in terms of um, yeah, yeah, sharing sharing something cool. I don't know. Yeah, and it's interesting what you said about people being helpful. I, I was in a, a Twitter space um, a couple of days ago, and. Uh, a couple of people were talking. I, I was just listening, but a couple of people were talking um, and one guy was saying, um, you know, he was, you know, uh, going to be launching his uh, an NFT collection of his um, and this guy uh, that was talking to him basically offered him to do a um, promotional video for it uh, for free. And I was like, wow, you know, there's people sort of willing to help help people out at that kind of level without any expectation of, uh, you know, anything in return. And, you know, when you see that sort of thing in the community and, you know, some people might say, oh, well, he's devaluing his his efforts and his work. But, you know, I, I don't necessarily see it that way because I see that as him you know, reaching out a hand to to help somebody else, you know, as opposed to that may may not have the skills or ability to do what he can do, you know. Um, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, but it's it's just it's really interesting, particularly in the last um, say six months since uh, Twitter started their their spaces area. That for me in particular has really changed the game in terms of how social media, how I've been interacting with social media and how how it, uh, how I'm perceiving it. But um, Yeah, it's quite fascinating, isn't it? I think like Twitter for me is quite hard yakka because I haven't got much time on my hands. So yeah, yeah. Um, I find that quite challenging, but I just get in there when I can and have a go. But I, I know what you mean about the spaces. I really, um, especially when we're on, you know, full lockdown here, a few weeks back I just spent like four nights in a row just listening to it and it was really helpful and positive 
and nice to just go okay well there are you know there are lots of other people in the same position and well as you say willing to help out and I think what's cool about this time in the world is that people like that guy you're just talking about he wouldn't do that for every person he comes across no in, absolutely in a, twitter, in a twitter space but he just felt that in that moment that was the right thing to do for him exactly to help that yeah. person and imagine if we all did that and i think this is the thing about i find about um particularly photography tourism and stuff like that in new zealand is it was getting pretty control out of control before covid so yeah, yeah. we had some crazy stuff going on in our country we we're about to have five million tourists arrive every year into a mm-hmm. population of five million. So it, you know, it just was like Jackson, double. But... <laughs> but we didn't have the infrastructure. And you know, uh, yeah. I don't know if this is a conversation for the podcast, but we didn't have the community infrastructure was a mess because we didn't have enough housing for our own people. Yeah. Um so you know there's been a lot of stuff that has happened over that time it's been hard but there's you know and people like me I've lost my whole income and had to start again twice because we've had two yep. lockdowns um and that's been pretty shit but at the same time I've gained a lot of things out of it and it's really made me ask myself some hard questions about what's my purpose and I think yeah. that's something that's really powerful and also I've spent a lot more time with my kids even though I always sort of did before but you know I've been more purposeful about that as well and I just I don't know I think it's going to be really cool in the future we're going to have a a different way of doing things but people will still be out there enjoying nature and taking awesome photos just like we did before it's just going to take a bit of time time to change things around but I think in a lot of ways it'll be a better version of ourselves right like for for those I guess for those of us that choose that option mm-hmm. um you know we might choose to be nicer or kinder or help more helpful that's not involving money um and i personally have ex- have experienced that in landscape photography a lot um in my journey that you know a lot of people have been really kind to me and shared their knowledge so yeah, you know yeah. it's i think that's really cool and, and why wouldn't you you know at the end of the day so absolutely yeah. even though i run workshops now i still have um I don't really advertise it but I have free groups that people can join adventures for free sometimes when I'm just going out and I'll be like hey who wants to come you know so you know I think at the end of the day you you know you you get a strategy that works for you and I think the Twitter strategy is really interesting for New Zealand because Twitter is not a normal thing that Kiwis do we're not Twitter people um, well, it used, used to be known as a real political cesspit, and particularly, you know, yeah. uh, U, US and UK politics, you know, with Bre- Brexit and, uh, you know, uh, the, uh, the, the the Trump years of uh, his presidency and whatever, you know, and it just sort of seemed to be this polarising uh, political landscape that didn't really help anyone communicate well, but... The photography community, on the other hand, I think is, you know, almost globally in the last six months, just sort of pulled together like I've never seen it done before. Yeah, absolutely right. And I think, you know, I've met people from overseas as well and in different places. And, uh, you know, I think even people like Gary V, you know, they've pulled yep. that whole community together as well, and not just photography, but creative arts. And mm-hmm. to me, that's really cool because, We've always kind of been a bit behind the eight ball from being a real business, um, you know. <laughs> yep. People are like, oh, did you do photography for a living? Oh, okay. Like they don't know what to say next because it's like, okay. yeah. oh, is that a real job? <laughs> yeah, isn't that a hobby? <laughs> yeah. Uh, and I guess to be fair for most people, it probably is a hobby. But um, Yeah, very much so, yeah. You know, it's. It, I think the arts are becoming a lot more uh it's becoming a lot more acceptable not that I care what anyone thinks about that but it's becoming a lot more acceptable for people to choose that direction which is probably 25 percent of the population is is geared like that so it's really cool that a place like Twitter has the platform and and so I think Instagram to a degree too but um at the moment Twitter seems to be quite uh free of an algorithm but I don't know 
about that, yeah. but it seems I, okay. I, I, think, I think there's definitely yeah. an algorithm there, but I'm not sure exactly. Not what, quite but, so bad as some of the yeah. others, yeah. Um, but, you know, I always be, I'm always a believer. People go, oh, Facebook's just, you know, mucking with the algorithm, whatever. But actually what I've found is that really good content always gets shared. So Absolutely, I think that's yeah. actually yeah. a really key point to social media is, uh, and, you know, the NFT space is quite interesting. I've seen some stuff on there where I'd go, yeah. oh, okay, that's not what I was expecting. But, um, you know, and I think that's definitely about relationships, people that yeah. Yeah. have worked hard on that and good luck to them. Absolutely. Um, but, you know, some really good work out there that hasn't even been shared yet. That's the other thing that's this, totally, from yeah. what I can understand. Yeah. And I'm, about I'm, I'm finding new photographers all the time that I've never, never seen or heard of that, uh, you know, and, and seeing their work for the first time and just being blown away by by, by some of the things that I'm seeing. But um, oh, some of the young ones are incredible. And oh, absolutely. In Zealand, it'll be yeah. the same in Aussie, but in New Zealand we have photography as a subject at high school now. Yep. So there's all those young ones who have just got that natural flair, which is really yeah. special and cool as well. Yeah. yeah. There's a couple of young fellas actually on the um, – on the Twitter spaces and that that are like 19, 16, 20. Like I'm just I've, like an aura of them. I've seen 15, 16-year-old photographers yeah. that I, Incredible. I think are better than me, you know. <laughs> oh, they're amazing. They're yeah. amazing. Yeah. But, yeah. Um, and that's really inspiring, isn't it? Absolutely, you know, that's what I yeah. think what you're saying is that everyone to you know, everyone together, it doesn't matter what you know, where you come from, what shape, colour, whatever, you can all prosper or connect or whatever. I yeah. think that's why I like spaces because it's not a video and probably why I like podcasts because I don't have to show my face, which probably yeah. sounds yeah. weird, weird, but I think there's just like an element of uh, freedom and mm -hmm. uh, just listening to voices rather than video. Definitely. definitely. Lot, yeah, yeah, which is kind of cool because you also actually have to actively listen. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I was in a in a space. Uh, I think it was last weekend, and uh, there was a guy on from Kampala in Ethiopia. Uh, sorry, Uganda. Um, wow. And he he'd gone. He's he's an amazing portrait photographer. Um, William something or other. Sorry, I can't remember his name off the top of my head because it was a week ago, and my head's full of other stuff <laughs> now. Uh, but you know, he he'd gone out for breakfast and was walking down the street, listening to listening to, but interacting in a in a um in a space. And you know, you had this uh, whenever he was talking, you had this background noise of the streets of Kampala in in Uganda going on, and it was just just a really unusual experience that you've got this you know this guy first thing in the morning in Kampala. I'm sitting at home. You know, in, in my lounge room at uh, you know six or seven o'clock at night or whenever it was, and uh, listening to the the streetscape, I guess of uh, of Kampala, it was uh, it was just fascinating so to, to, yeah, to be so a part crazy. of. Yeah, you know? <laughs> that's awesome. I love that. Yeah. yeah, and I think that's the thing I think about. You know, me starting in photography too. To be to be brutal, when I first started, I think people looked at me as a single mum through Women's Refuge trailing around with these three children like who the hell she like honestly like I think yeah. people didn't rate me at all and that was um okay because we do that in life but I just was like actually you know what I'm gonna do this and I think it was the fact that people judged me or, or I felt maybe they didn't but I felt they did um a lot not everybody you know we had a couple of really cool friends but I think that helped me to actually get better at it because I didn't take it as a personal sure. attack I just went okay I can see I don't fit the normal mold that's cool I get that um, but I'm just going to go out there and do this and you know I guess because I had nothing to lose I just yeah. went for it and I felt like I was fairly under the radar and a wee bit um, I tried to be quite humble um, about what I was doing and so you know people just help me so I just I like to sort of get that in there in my talks because I think it's really important for people who feel like they can't do it actually mm. if I can do it you can definitely do it you know definitely definitely talking talking about your workshops 
uh, or going back to talk about your workshops. What would somebody coming on a uh, Rachel Gillespie workshop expect to experience? Yep, sweet. So we have a couple of different options. Um, so sometimes it's just me, other times it's me and a couple of my colleagues who I work with. So we actually have in our uh, photography workshop business, it's called Southern Photography Adventures. We have five photographers and we're all based in different parts of South Island. So mm -hmm. if there's, uh, you know, two or three or four people, I might just take them myself. If there's more than that, then we'll have two tutors. Sometimes we might even have three tutors, depending sure. on the number of people. Um, so predominantly, it's usually about a three-night, four-day uh, sort of a gig, or it could be a private one-on-one, -on -one, depending on what people are looking for. Yep. We find the group shops are really interactive and people get to know each other and have a, a bit of fun and, and all that together as well. So that seems to be quite popular um, to come on that. And so usually we will meet up um, and everyone gets to have a bit of an introduction. We'll talk about our schedule and our itinerary, which we always set beforehand often subject to the weather because of the changing alpine environment that we're in. Um, but we try and, you know, stick to that as much as we can. And I like to go through and ask people what they came for and what they're expecting and, you know, what do they want to take away when they go home so that we can make sure as a, a tutor that we can give them, you know, what they're looking for, what they paid for basically to come along to a workshop. So usually we find that people... Um, go home with obviously a lot more than they're expecting we do post-processing as well as part of the workshops so mm -hmm. um depending on the weather again we'll possibly go out and shoot a whole bunch of raw files first um before we get into editing depending on weather patterns um we want to obviously get as much content as possible so sometimes the editing's more or less depending if it's raining or something like that and then we have follow-on editing options for people um, once I've obviously gone home and online and things like that. We're just in the process of creating some videos. We try and like to keep it real personal and, um, yeah. you know, face-to-face -face as much as we can. We don't really want to set up a online business, um, but we're sort of trying to also realise that, you know, everybody's got different wants and needs and things as well. But there's, I mean, there's so much content on the internet already, on YouTube that you can get some of that stuff from there anyway. So our, oh. our experience, I guess you could call it, is uh, more of an out in the field. We'll take you to our favourite spots. Um, we'll teach you how to get there. We'll teach you why you would do certain things. We'll teach you how to read the weather and, you know, what time. Like when people are new to it, they don't even realise to go an hour before sunset or sunrise. So Yeah, yeah they turn the up at sunset and, or sunrise. Yeah, and... so, you know, there's a lot of simple things at the start when you're a beginner. So we do have a lot of beginners. We also have um, right up to advanced. So we have different workshops sometimes. And then our, we also have two sort of different uh, genres. So we'll have... A workshop where you can pretty much get out of the car and take a bunch of foot shots and then get back in or you can go on a walk to a glacier and a bit of an adventure and you know stretch your legs awesome it's more moderate fitness so um it just depends on where people sit so you know sometimes we might have somebody who's like 18 and then somebody who's 65 on a workshop and then a whole bunch in between so we have to just work that through depending on what what you know what we've got most of our workshops are uh targeted to the season so we might do autumn leaves and stars or spring and stars or yeah. astrophotography winter um winter landscapes just depends on you know the time of the year really um usually like at the moment we've got our whole 2022 charted out for the year ahead could be a bit interesting to see how that actually pans out this time but you know yeah. We've got it out there, so let's hope that that happens. So I've just introduced a new product this year, which is a 10-day South Island tour, which I've had some pretty good success with so far in terms of bookings, so let's hope that happens. And, cool. uh, yeah, I'm quite excited about that because I think what's really important for me, as I've sort of said already, is it's important for me to actually connect with people, not just teach them how to take photos so yeah, yeah. Um, with those 10 day adventures you obviously you get to you know spend quite a lot of time together and 
I think it's through the having a good chat like even we are today. You learn things, how to do things by just talking. Um, you might be sitting having lunch and talking about something and then they click. Oh, yeah. that's what you meant when you said that last the other night, you know. Yeah, yeah. Um, I don't know about you, but I've definitely done that over the months later where I've been out with somebody and then something's clicked and I've gone, oh, that's what he meant all those months ago and I didn't quite get it. <laughs> yeah, yeah I'm, um, I've been, been there, done that, yeah. <laughs> yeah, and so we find a lot of our photography clients come to multiple events because they love what we're about and how we do things and, you know, just the way we the way we roll. So that's pretty special. I think if you weren't getting repeat business, then you might need to take a look at your strategy. Um. Well, I, that's how I think about it. If I wasn't getting repeat customers, I'd be having to have a look at why not. Um, so that's pretty cool. And what we find is a lot of our repeat customers, they don't have friends who do photography outside of, yeah. you know, outside of their, in their normal lives. So I like to provide a space for people like that as well who just want to come with other photographers to do cool stuff. So. Yeah. Yeah, we try and price it sort of middle of the road. We're not cheap, but we're not expensive. We're kind of in the middle. And that's quite a challenge at times to get right. Um, New Zealanders at the moment, we're, all our clients are Kiwis, so they're a lot harder on, um, you know, the price than yeah. maybe someone from well, overseas. A lot, lot of people so. are Scottish descent there, isn't they? <laughs> apparently, apparently. <laughs> <laughs> Spend all their money on whiskey. No. Yeah. yeah, so, I mean, you know, I think that's uh, definitely hard. Like when I was doing my uh, tourism business and photography guiding, I was making four times the amount per client than I am now. So that yeah. makes a big difference. Um, it was probably a bit ridiculous, to be fair, but that was the going rate. So people used to pay it and yep. we were very lucky. Um but, you know, I think as time goes by, we'll get possibly a bit more of a balance around that. And yeah. it's not always about making money. It's about experience and yeah. Yeah. taking people to cool places. And, you know, so long as you can feed your family, then I guess that's pretty cool. So, yeah. And I think, I yeah. think that's one of the, the hardest parts for, for photographers in particular is that question around pricing, you know, whether it be a wedding photographer, whether it be print, pricing whether it be you know experience pricing you know it, it is tough to come up with okay so where am I placing myself in the market what am I yeah. you know what 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 are my costs and how do I cover those and how do I, you know what what kind of profit margin am, am I going to put on it and yeah uh, absolutely it took me a while to figure that out too actually and yeah. I think because I had that entrepreneurial background I had probably a bit more experience in that already but um, I think what I, I guess you've got to decide, like, if you want to make money from your photography, what kind of photographer do you want to see yourself in the marketplace? It's almost yeah. like hopping outside of your own body and having a look above, you know, like yeah. I just decided I had a, um, I've always been about quality. So yep. I wanted to have high quality prints on high quality paper so that yeah, was yeah. my my thing and then I learned a lot about paper I didn't really understand that at the start and took me a while to figure that out that not all printers and papers are the same mm -hmm. um so I learned, I I used German um fine art rag and sometimes a few other bits and bobs but mostly German paper and I'm just looking into uh, there's possibly some new stuff coming to New Zealand that's made from bamboo, which would be quite cool for the yeah. car carbon footprint thing. And, yeah, so I just decided, right, I'm going to do high-end prints on high-end paper with really high-quality ink. So that was my, after my research of looking at all the options, that was my strategy, and I don't ever change that. So my prints aren't cheap, but they're, quality so yeah. I think that's something you have to decide for yourself if you want to print stuff out I wanted something that was going to be something you could put in a frame as a fine art print and you know hand that down to other other generations yeah. so that's what I do 
and people seem to be quite happy to pay for that quality. Mm-hmm. Um, I probably miss some sales because of that as well, but it's just a choice you've got to make, I guess. I didn't want to go down to the local photocopy shop and print them out on, you know, basic Canon paper or something yeah, like yeah, that because they yeah. just don't last. So, no, oh, no, but, you know, I'm not telling people what to do. Um, <laughs> I sell a lot of, I sell a lot of canvases. A lot of people sell go to places like Canvas Factory. I wouldn't do that personally, but they okay. Um, I want the higher end, and all my pictures are varnished as well. So, sure. <clears throat> excuse me. I think if you, you know, you really want to provide quality, then you know it's worth looking into that. So I personally make about a hundred percent markup on my pictures. So right, okay. I think it's very achievable. Some people make more than that. Um, yep. just depends on what you want to do in this current market I've chosen not to discount because I don't feel desperate or the need to sell a whole lot of stuff um, you know if I was struggling to pay my bills I might do that but I just I'm trying to maintain my um, level of pricing as much as I can I did put my commercial rate down quite a bit over 2020 just to get some work Um, but I've actually recently put that back up to what it was before because I've kind of got to the stage where I'm like okay I did 18 months of basically half price I'm not going to do that anymore so it just becomes like your own barometer I guess it's like if you were working for somebody else what how much you're willing to take a pay cut you know yeah, um, type of thing so and it's just I guess it's goods and services if people want to buy you know cheap shoes versus fancy shoes it's kind of the same thing with prints I guess definitely definitely what do you like to do when you're not shooting well oh, that's a good question I don't really do a hell of a lot else other than working shooting and being a mum to be honest yeah I'm pretty dedicated to the camera it's my thing so I pretty much feel like I'm not really working when I'm out. So I guess that's kind of cool. Yeah. Um, I don't mind a good coffee. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, Or, yeah, I don't know. I just, I I probably, I do, I go camping. So I've got a wee caravan and I love to get that all, um, you know, ready to go and set up camp and just the whole experience of being out camping and in the outdoors and, even if I'm not taking photos, it's just about being out in nature, I guess. It's, I'm pretty simple. I'm pretty cheap to run, mate. I don't go <laughs> shopping. <laughs> Fair enough. Yeah. Uh, I'm not your normal female, really. I'm quite happy about that. So if, if you weren't a photographer, what would you be? Well, originally when I was young, I always wanted to be a horse trainer and work with horses. So okay, probably something along those lines. And it's been really neat to get back into the um, wild horses photography because I'm also getting, um, you know, some pretty cool connections through New Zealand horse industry because the people mm-hmm. I'm working with there are quite well-known. Um, one of the girls, Kelly Wilson, she's a pretty good horse photographer herself. So um, that's been pretty neat. I don't know where that's going to take me. I used to ride horses a lot, so yep, I'd love to somehow maybe get into doing a bit of what they call liberty training which is sort of like the horse whispering yeah, yeah. I probably would have done that if I hadn't got off that track but back in the day um, when I was young which is quite a long time ago um it was sort of really not a money-making industry to be in so yeah, had right. I followed my heart I probably would have been a horse trainer but had I but I didn't so yeah, it's funny how the world brings you back around to, to those yeah, loves definitely. again, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> I, I do love being a mum as well. And I think, you know, that my my uh, expectation of what I thought being a mum was going to be was very, very different to what it actually ended up being. I never, ever Im- imagined I would be a single mum going through Women's Refuge. So, yeah, sure. um, you know, I, I talk, I'm pretty open about it because I think it's really important to – help other people through these things and um, I'm pretty happy with who I am these days it was a bit of a journey to get through that but 
I think, you know, if you have a good family around you and, or, or friends who you call family, then you, you're pretty successful. That's my my uh, interpretation of life. No, that's great. That's great. So are there any uh, photographers out there that you think I should be talking to, um, you know, bringing on to the podcast that uh, you, you're seeing around the traps? Oh, mate, I can give you a list. <laughs> I know. There's plenty I... of Kiwis, plenty of Kiwis out there. Yeah, I mean, I do some really cool work with a, with a few um, of my own colleagues. So, of course, I'll be um, referring them on to you. I, I, you might know. I think you know Megan Maloney, yep. um, of Twitter. So her and I do a few workshops together. And um, Douglas Thorne, um, he's he's also one of the guys I work with down in uh, Fiordland, down at Milford Sound. He's a pretty successful full-time photographer himself. And um, then I've got a couple of others. I've got Joseph Pauley and um, Lake Tikapo, Rach Roberts on the West Coast, and Jordan McAnally from Queenstown. So they're my sort of – all what those guys are my colleagues that I work with. Um, yeah, right on there but I mean if you want a different specific subject just sing out and I can probably there's heaps of heaps of different cool characters that I could refer you on to for sure oh, de definitely yeah. and if I if I ever run out it is I've got a very very long list but if I ever run out <laughs> you'll be I'll, doing it three nights a week <laughs> well to be honest I, I I have actually been doing uh, a couple a week um just awesome. to build up a bit of a a, a backlog so that if I you know, for whatever reason, you know, basically I'm I'm kind of prepping for when I can go out and shoot um, yeah. and, the you know, the time when I do expect that I'm probably going to spend more time taking photos than I am doing podcasts about it. So, you know. Yeah, I wanted, exactly. <laughs> I wanted to build a little bit of a, a backlog so that I, I could miss a week or two without uh, too much drama. So, yeah, no, thanks so much for having me on. It's been awesome and, uh, you know, hopefully people got something useful out of that. And if you come over to New Zealand sometime, we'll be able to do uh, something live on the lake. Definitely. That sounds like a, a fantastic idea. And if you're <laughs> in Sydney, just uh, give us a, a, a tingle and we'll go and, go and shoot a swimming pool or something somewhere. <laughs> <laughs> sounds awesome, mate. Well, um, before you go, I've got one last and probably the most important question of all. Yeah. Do you like pineapple on pizza? I do. <laughs> <laughs> it's that thing, isn't it? You're either in or you're out. That's right. You can't you can't be on one side of the fence or the other. <laughs> but do you know what? My pizzas are always gluten free, so I'm that no, person. Like that. Cool. <laughs> <laughs> You have. Uh, awesome. I, I, I've got one more question for you. Do you have violet crumble or crunchy over there, or or both? I don't think we have violet crumble here. We only have crunchy. Yeah. I might be. I remember that. I remember that from living in Sydney. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> no, crunchy all the way. It's Fair and enough. it's pavlova, by the way, as well. <laughs> <clears throat> I'm not gonna. I'm not gonna enter into that argument. <laughs> I was lucky we didn't talk rugby. No, definitely. Mind you, the, <laughs> the old Wobblies had a uh, a win last night against the uh, Argentinians, which was all right. Oh, good on you. Yeah. Yeah, actually, well, the, last, the last rugby game I watched was actually at uh, Milford Sound Lodge while we are in the middle of a workshop and it was Aussie Kiwis a few months back. I think it was oh, the, one of the Bledisloes. So. I'm, I'm pretty sure I know who won. <laughs> <laughs> There's a bit of hurrahing going on. I can imagine. I can imagine. <laughs> oh well, one one, awesome one day, one one year, we'll get a team that can actually beat the uh, the All Blacks. But uh, I, I don't think it'll be this year or next year somehow. <laughs> so got a lot never of say never, eh? No, definitely not. Well, I I mean, I I you know remember the uh, the, the the good old days in the. Um, the 80s and 90s when when we had a team which could beat the All Blacks, which wasn't too bad, but, you know. Yeah, actually, I must admit, I remember that myself. I'm old enough for that. <laughs> <laughs> Never mind. All right, well, thank you very much for, you know, taking the time, Rachel. It's been absolutely, uh, you know, a joy to sit and listen to you talk and, uh, you know, find out about how you do your thing and, you know, 
get to, get to know you a little bit better. Where can people find your work? Awesome, thank you. Uh, just on Instagram is Rachel Gillespie NZ or my website is nztraveladventure.com. Thanks very much. Thanks, mate. Appreciate having me on. No problem. Thanks again for Cheers. listening to Landscape Photography World. I hope you enjoyed the show and keep on listening because I'll be joined by some great guests in upcoming episodes. You can find my work in this podcast at grantswinburnphotography.com. I'm also on Instagram, Twitter and Facebook. I'm Grant Swinburne and I hope to see you out shooting soon.